So we've heard that we have an operation center that is 24 seven. People have to be able to understand data, pointing at spacecraft, sometimes billions of kilometers away, be willing to save a rover, quite literally sometimes on Mars, if it's gone into emergency operation. So how do you get the people to do that? Like, do you just put an ad in the paper, say, do you want to go save rovers on Mars? Look, in some ways it is just like putting an ad in the paper, but you can't go off and do a university course anywhere yep. in deep space communications. Mm. So you find people have good aptitude and attitude in different fields. Okay. So it might be in programming, it could be in radio communications, it could be just in you know, handling IT computer systems, simple as that. And then you bring those people in and you train them up to our standards. So okay. especially here in Canberra, we're now the center of excellence for communication training. Okay. Uh, literally we wrote the courses and we have people come from the other stations in oh, Spain okay. and California to learn how to do it and get that, you know, Cert 3 yeah, yeah, <laughs> certificate. Yeah. And it, usually it's about a year of okay. training okay. before you might hand a, an operator to do that particular job, you know, without any supervision at okay. all. So there's a lot that goes into it. And you're taking in the experience of people who have worked in this room for 20, 30 years and more. So this is a job which gives you pretty excellent job security. We'll <laughs> never run out of universe to explore. <laughs> that's so right, that's right. yeah, once we have people in here, I think the youngest person probably in here has probably worked about 20 years. Oh, God. Yeah. Okay. So they're, they're dedicated for as long as the life of the mission plus time. Yeah, and look, they're just an most amazing, dedicated group of people that I've ever worked with. They're here 24 seven. If there's a spacecraft in trouble on Christmas day at three o'clock in the morning, they're here and yeah. making sure that those spacecraft can come back to life and get all that data that we want to get. And so how many people are on site or, you know, on average or total here? So working for the complex right yeah. for us at the moment, there's 85 people, okay. mostly engineers, technicians, and about 20 or about 18 now on our okay. spacecraft operations team. And then there's all the other people that we need to operate the site yeah. and logistics and cooks, gardeners, cleaners, admins, somebody to do the paperwork. Yeah. So, so a lot of those engineers are working on the maintenance, management upgrades of the actual dishes and systems themselves? Yeah, and it's making sure that those antennas are in tip-top shape all the time so yeah. that they can do their job 24-7 flawlessly. All that maintenance is really, really important. Upgrades on the antennas, which can have an antenna offline for a couple of months while it gets new receivers, new transmitters, or a new drive system installed. But of course, again, it comes to this team to make sure all of that works yeah. at the point where they're supposed to be pointing, dealing with space and time as we do this communication work. Now, as we start to see more and more missions taking off, you know, there's a lot happening this year and the next years uh, to every place in the solar system and now getting beyond the solar system. What is the future? I mean, how busy is this going to get? How is it that going to be managed? So if you look back to just maybe seven or eight years ago, you'd have a single operator mm -hmm. operating a single antenna yep. and communicating with a single spacecraft. Okay. Now you can have an operator dealing with three antennas at the same time okay. in different locations around the planet and talking up to five to seven spacecraft simultaneously. So that's a pretty big multiplying in terms of uh, complexity. Yeah, and so the capacity keeps being increased. Yep. Our team's really, really good at developing new ways, new techniques to be able to do that kind of work, more automation in the system system yep. using artificial intelligence okay. to actually help us improve the way we communicate with some spacecraft. Other spacecraft, of course, still need that hands-on, that okay. TLC every day to make sure they can do their job. And this is that kind of sometimes based on the age or how advanced the craft is or how complex it is? or. Sometimes the older spacecraft are the most reliable. It's the new kids on the block that have all the troubles. Okay. And of course, it's not always the spacecraft itself. It's the brand new team ah, with a brand new mission. And they gotcha. are really nursing their spacecraft along. Gotcha. So you're not only dealing with the, you know, the robot, you're also dealing with that human being. And, and that can be just as challenging, if not more. Interesting. And so trying to manage the relationships between the mission team and operation team, as well as here is a, an, an added job that yeah. essentially you have and to And I do. think that's the most important thing people need to remember about space exploration, whether it's radio astronomy or optical astronomy or any area of science. It's not all about the technology. Yep. It is about the human being behind the scenes with the brain to make all of this possible. So we've heard that data comes through these dishes, comes through the center. Now, do you, what does it look like? Like, I mean, is it just pretty pictures all of a sudden on your screen? Is it zeros and ones? Like, you know, when I take an image through an optical telescope, yeah, it's 
kind of that, but there's still some processing here. But what is it like for data from a spacecraft? Yeah, everybody thinks it's like in the movie The Martian, where you're suddenly <laughs> seeing these pictures up on the screen, but it's anything but that. For us, it's literally just the ones and zeros and a okay. wiggly line on the screen. Most of the data we're looking at is simply the signals from the spacecraft, the yep. data packets, the amount of information that should be coming through, making sure that it all adds up, the checksums are all there, yep. and effectively just the scheduling that okay. we need to go through, all the different steps that happen during the course of that mission. So it sounds really boring. <laughs> But we do have a screen that we kind of sometimes refer to as the glee meter. Okay. Because particularly if there's a big event on, we're about to land somewhere, yeah, go into yeah. orbit somewhere, we like to watch the live broadcast coming yeah, from yeah. a mission control center. And so we're just getting the data through. We don't know whether it's good news or bad news uh, until we see the reaction at the other end. So, so you almost have like this interesting delay, right? You get the data, you know it said something, but you don't know what it said. So you have to wait till it goes to the team and then they get to determine. Yeah. And the reaction is the high fives, you know, yeah, yeah, all, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, all yeah. the hugs and tears and cheers and all that sort of stuff. And that we know it means that actually the data is actually good. If we've got long, sullen faces, <laughs> it's not a great day. At the you office. turn off the channel and uh, go somewhere else. So we do like to see the glee meter go up to 11. Nice. So that's, so that's really cool. So it's really the data then has to be processed and interpreted by the mission operation teams uh, of those spacecraft rather than actually here. Yeah. And that sometimes is not even immediate. It yep. can take days, weeks, months, sometimes years to get the data back and process it and to know whether you've got good information, something you were expecting to discover or something completely new. Uh, we like to be able to see you know that immediate reaction yeah. just to know that we've done a good job but sometimes it's all even better to know we're, that we're not here at all mm. because that's the one thing people see about space they see pretty picture from mars yep. happy scientists at the other end but the deep space network is that vital connection in between that makes it all go and so you don't hear a lot about the network because we do our job so well it's transparent if we messed up then you'd hear about That's it. That's right. Oh, we didn't get our precious data. We don't know if it crashed or it did crash because they didn't allow us to communicate it or something like that. And of course, this is the other thing is that you, when you do see that happy scientist and the cheers after a landing on Mars or some other major event that they've worked for years on, yeah. you think, you know, are we doing the same? Are we jumping up and doing the high fives? No, because we still have a job to do. Mm. There's still data coming in. They, they've got the time to celebrate now, but we still have to maintain that contact with the spacecraft. Because there's other spacecraft you're still monitoring. Yeah. at the same time. It's not only their mission, but the other 40 that are out there at the present time. So space never quits. Space never quits. And as I say, great job security because it never ends either. Nice.